Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. I cannot take a piece of clay molded into man. But I have a father. I have a father. support but our 
prayers with this family. And we want them to feel that and know that. Amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Amen. Good to see the long our family came in here to hear their pastor preach. All right. Good deal. Amen. <laughs> Can't slip in here. You know, you? All right. Thank the Lord. Good to see all of our friends that are back this Sunday. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Isaiah chapter 50, uh, verse 7. I'll read there. And I'm going to the New Testament, Colossians 1 and 23. <coughs> Isaiah 50 and verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. For the Lord will help me. I'll not be confounded. Nor will I be ashamed. Colossians 1 and 23. It's been prefaced with the statement. With the writer who talks about. Amen. How that God is going to present you. Holy and unvulnerable and unreprovable in his sight. And then he goes on to say this. If you continue in the faith. Grounded. Settled. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. You know, if in this life only we had hope, right, yeah. we'd be of all men most miserable. But that's one common thread that binds us all together is that we have hope yep. that there's a land that's better. He said this, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I want to use something that's really not from my generation. I'm going to borrow it from yours. But it's a statement that I heard made some time ago, and I looked it up just to make sure it was in the idiom dictionary. It's simply a phrase, putting on your game face. Now, that's not from my day, but there you go. I'll let it out. Amen. Thank you, Brother. Brother Turner. I, well, I couldn't say it any better than that right there. The definition for putting on your game face is a facial expression that suggests a strong determination to succeed or win. All right. That little fellow, if you're looking at his game face, it seems to indicate just that. <laughs> I've made up my mind, I'm going to succeed, and I'm going to win. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise and thank you for it. Thank you for the word. Hallelujah. Oh, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. Dr. Alex Martinez from Ohio State University said we've gone beyond just a couple of facial expressions to understand the disposition of individuals. But he said, we found a strong consistency as we made our studies of over 5,000 individuals using facial recognition that there are more than just two or three expressions that are made by the face. Now, probably if I ask you how many you think there were, you'd be probably like me. I would settle on three or four. But the fact is, and I'll not go into all the weeds about this, but there's 21 21. Some I've never heard of, but I guess I've got them. They say I do. They said you can be happy, you can be sad, you can be fearful, you can be angry, you can be surprised, you can be disgusted. But then you can be happily surprised. <laughs> that was one. You can be happily disgusted. I'm not going to try all these. I don't know if I can do it or not. Sadly fearful. Sadly angry. I can get that one out there. Sadly surprised. Sadly disgusted. Fearfully angry. Fearfully surprised. Fearfully disgusted. Angrily surprised. Angrily disgusted. Disgustedly surprised. Man, that's how you reverse that. Appalled. Of course, just pure hatred and then awe, oh, you know. You just stand in awe. I didn't realize there were those many different facial expressions. 
But the one that I'm really focusing on here today is the one that little fellow's got right there. Amen. And that is putting on our game face. I, uh, as I look over the different events that are happening in recent, I cannot help but think of some of the far outlandish things that some people are proposing to be done in our day. And the waste of dollars and tax dollars and all kinds of crazy things. But <clears throat> I heard that in the state of California, especially in San Francisco, that many of the schools there are going to be renamed. And uh, the reason they're renaming them is because they don't like the name Abraham Lincoln. They don't like the name George Washington. They don't like the name Thomas Jefferson. I did hear somebody come up with a great answer. They said, I've got the answer for those that feel like that our predecessors were not pure enough, nor straight enough, nor, you know, example enough to qualify for their name to be in granite and on stone. He said, but I've got the answer. He said, I don't know whether they like it or not, but let's name all the schools Jesus Christ. Amen. But I got a feeling that ain't going to fly. Because really that's not what they're looking for. They're not looking for somebody that's without taint or sin or have ever made a mistake. They're just disgruntled. You know, and there's all kinds of no doubt feelings that are afloat here today. We see everything around us is being attacked. Uh, morality is being attacked. Church is being attacked. Schools, children are being attacked. Amen, people are saying you need to apologize for your race, whether you're white, black, or Spanish. You need... No, no, I'm gonna tell you something right now. God made us the way that we are. And when God got through making anything he made, he said it's good. So I don't care if you're Japanese, Chinese, Taiwanese, Americanese, amen, Texanese. When God got through with you, he called it good. So you don't need to apologize to anybody for who you are or what you are. God made you in his own image and you are good. Let's give God a happy praise for that. But we're faced with a lot of things. There's a lot of things that are under attack today. And I want you to know the enemy, Satan himself, is doing everything he can to undermine the basic principles, foundations upon which, amen, our country, our nation, our churches, individuals' lives are built. But I come to with you today with a challenge. And I think we need to repeat what Isaiah said. For the Lord will help me. Therefore, I shall not be confounded. The word, when you look at confounded in an original Greek, or excuse me, uh, Hebrew, it, it renders it as this. To be confused. To be confused. Amen. There's a lot of people today, and I hear it said over and over again, I don't know what the answer is. I really don't know. I just know that we're living in a confused world. And they keep saying, I wish somebody would come up and just stand up and give us an answer in this day and hour. I might just say on a side note, Brother Norvell, the stage is being set for somebody that will stand up and bring the whole world together. And I believe probably more than likely he's already walking this earth and that someday will receive his coronation. But I'm not on that side of things. Amen. I've already given my faithfulness and my devotion and my allegiance to somebody else. His name is Jesus. And I want you to know he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And I tell you today, my friend, he's coming back. He's coming back. And if you're not ready this morning, you need to get ready. Because Jesus Christ is coming back. And as the angels declared, the same Jesus. That you see ascend up into the heavens shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go away. Amen. In the midst of all of this, there are two forces that are fighting for the souls of humanity. One of them is under the administration of hell, and the other is under the administration of heaven. And I've already sworn my allegiance to Jesus Christ, and I'm going to put my day face on. And I want the devil to know I did not get in this to lose. 
I said I did not get in this to lose. I got in this thing called the church because I believe that we're going to win. Can somebody say praise the Lord? I know some folks feel like they're like that little fella at the Little League game. He was sitting on the, the bleachers. Amen. And the game had already gone into about six innings. And they never had been up. Amen. He was sitting in the bleachers. An old boy walked by and he said, I'm going to tell you something. It looks like you guys are really getting the beating of your life. He said, oh, no, not yet. He said, we haven't even been up yet. <laughs> he made it more personal. He said, I haven't even been up to that yet. Yeah. Amen. I want to serve notice on this generation. There's some folks in the battery box. Amen. They haven't even been up yet. But I tell you, they got their game face on. They did not come this far to lose. They did not come this far to quit. They did not come this far to backslide. They did not come this far to give up on Jesus Christ. But they got their game face on. Which simply means they have come to succeed. They have come to win. And someday they're going to hear the voice of God say, Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. To the joys of the Lord. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make your rule over many. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. He said the Lord will help me. I'll not be confounded. One of the most horrible things outside of fear. Amen. Is to be in a place where you're totally confused. Amen. It's one thing to be lost and perhaps have some kind of a feeling that you know where you're going. You just need to make a right turn somewhere. But it's really bad and problematic when you don't know the right hand from the left. You don't know straight up and sideways. You're just lost in a fog. You don't have any idea where you are or where you're going. Did you know my Bible tells me there'll arise a generation that will call evil good and will call good evil? Let them arise a generation that has no morals. They have no mores. They have no principles. They have no sense of knowing what is right and wrong. And I've come to tell you, I believe that generation is here. I said that generation is here. Amen. And it is somehow that Satan has put forth a lie to bring about a state of confusion in the mind of a generation today. Amen. That they give you the response. It really doesn't matter what's right or what's wrong. Just as long as it doesn't affect you. Everybody just does their own thing and follows after their own ways. But I submit to you that's a lie from the pit of hell. My Bible said ye shall know the truth. I said it said ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Well, I'm here to declare to you there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father above all, through all, and in you all. He is Lord of Lord, He is King of Kings, and His name is Jesus Christ. Let's give Him some praise. He said, I'll not be confounded. But He said, he said because the Lord will help me. The second thing He said, is I will not be ashamed. What this implies is simply this when Isaiah stated it. He said, I'll not be disappointed if there is a delay. Now I could take a whole hour right there and just preach on people that cannot survive delays. I must admit to you, going through school was a test on whether I could survive the delay. Amen. When I was in the sixth grade and they told me I had 12 more, that was eternity. I went to school every day looking for the last day. It seemed like it would never, ever happen. Amen. And especially around Christmas as a child, waiting on the gifts to be open. All through life, there are those hurdles that we are faced with. To teach us, amen, the blessings of surviving a delay. The Bible said that when, when Moses came out of Egypt, he went, amen, to the land of the or to the land of the wilderness, and then he told his people, I'm going up into that mountain. 
And for 40 days they did not see him nor hear his voice. And the Bible said after 40 days many of them began to look back to Egypt and to turn back in the direction of their past. Because they said we cannot survive the delay. I want to submit to you here today and hear me church. All through our walk with God there are going to be some delays. Isaiah said, I know there's going to be some delays. But he said, the Lord is going to help me. All right. He said, the Lord is going to help me. I'm preaching to some people here today. You've been praying about a different job. It hasn't happened. You've been praying about your children getting in the church, and it hasn't happened. You've been praying for your healing, and it hasn't happened. But I've come to tell you today, it's time to get your game face on. It's time to stop looking like you're hopeless or that you're confused or that you're ashamed. Set your face like a flint. Amen. And alert the devil and let him know I did not get in this thing to lose. I feel a losing spirit out there today. I feel like there's some folks need a little fire built underneath them. Amen. If you were a lady here today carrying a baby, I don't care whether you like it or not, honey. More than likely, you got nine months. Amen. Suck it up if you can. Amen. More than likely, you got nine months. But I'm going to tell you, the results of the nine months is going to make you smile. You're going to do stupid things. You're going to lean over cribs and talk baby talk. You're going to build tricycles. You're going to tell her she's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in a prom dress. But it took nine months. Hear me, church. We must not give up on God. We must get our game face back. I know that life has its disappointments. I know that life has its hurts and pains. And some of us may be hurting on the inside. But we need to look the devil straight in the eye. And tell him you're still looking at a winner. You're still looking at an overcoming. For I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God. Let's get our game face back. I'm in this to win. Losing is not an option. Winning may be delayed, but the end is never going to be in question. I said the end is never going to be in question. If you're playing and toying around with the option of losing, you need to get your game face on. I'm going to tell you, before you ever started this thing called living for God and walking this Christian race, the one that commissioned you. Amen. The Bible said he is the author and the finisher of our faith. He didn't say his faith. Amen. He doesn't need faith. He's a fact. He's an absolute. He's already there. It doesn't matter whether it's the past, present, or future. He's a fact. But when it comes to us, we've got to exercise a thing called believing. And the Bible said he's the author of our faith. I want you to know that anything God starts working on, anything God commissions, anything God is constructing, He doesn't do a halfway job. He didn't give me just enough faith to get me through 2020. No, bless God, He gave me enough that if there's a little bit of delay, I can make it through 22. I can make it through 23. I can make it all the way, bless God, to 23. And if it hangs out another hundred years and God still wants me here, I can live to be 169 years old. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get my damn face on. Because losing has never been an option. Never been an option. 
Somebody asked me years ago, why are you going to Glen Water? They don't have 6,000 people there. I don't know if they have that many when I came or not. All them people want to do is go deer hunting and fish for bass. Get you a bass boat and a hunting rifle. A man told me that, and he's still alive, but I don't tell you who he is. Amen. But you'd know him if I called his name. He said, I'm telling you, that's just, a, that's just a rural area. Get you a bass boat, get you a hunting rifle. And he said, go there and just think of it as just a place you're passing through. In other words, just think of it as a place where you're not going to win. All right. You know what really gets me stirred up at ease? <laughs> Woo! It's for somebody to tell me it can't be done. Amen. Oh, I get plum excited about that. I like that better than somebody slapping me on the back and saying you're doing a good job. You want to get me fired up, just come tell me it can't be done. Because bless God, I'm going to half the night trying to figure out how I can get it done. Amen. And a long time ago, I spent many a day on my face before God in this little office here. When I was looking at some trials and some challenges uh, as a young boy around 30-something years old, uh, I was overwhelmed, overcome with opposition. Uh, amen. And the devil walked up beside of me and said, you know what? You got an option. You could just bow out. Uh, but something came over me and I got my game face on. I said, devil, you're not talking to somebody that came here to quit. You're not talking to somebody that got in this thing to lose. You're not talking to somebody that was thinking about backsliding. Bless God, I started out and I planned to finish this race. I have begun. Let's give him some praise. Hallelujah, get your game face on. I said, get your game face on. Your children need to see your game face. Your brother needs to see your game face. Some people, you can read them like a book. My God, you can come to them. There. I don't think we have to be hypocrites. But I do think we have to have a sense of determination. Can you imagine what your children would think if you got out of bed in the morning going to work Amen. And you got in the kitchen and said, Honey, I just don't think I can make it today. And mama got her arm around you, patted you on the back, said, Oh, but you're a big boy. Your mama raised a big boy. I know you can go to work today, honey. Just go ahead. I got your lunch fixed. And, and she walked you out the car, shut you in the car, closed the door, gave you a kiss on the cheek and said, Come on, little boys and girls, brothers and sisters, gather around daddy and tell him he's a good man and he's going to be okay and he's a winner. My God, you should have settled a whole bunch of that stuff before you ever walked out from under your mama's apron string. When you walked out of her house, you should have had your game face on. No, you're not going to win everything, but they might never battle that you ever fight, but bless God, you're going to win the war. I said you're going to win the war. Oh, I must have done something up. I lost some of you about then. I said, let me tell you something. Get your game face on. Can you imagine being a pastor coming into this church and getting behind that pulpit and walking up here and saying, Church, I love you and I've tried to pastor for a few years, but I don't know if I can make it very far anymore. I just ain't for sure. I'm going to get behind it. Would y'all please support me? Let's believe that you think you know that I know where I'm going. Just believe me that I know where I'm going. Somehow or another, we're going to get there. He should have resigned last year. He should have resigned before he got in the pulpit. Nobody's going to follow anybody that doesn't really know where they're going. Bless God, get your back straightened out. Amen. Get your mama's apron strings off of you. Dust demon the dust off your Bible. Get your head back in the Word of God. Amen. Put some big boy bridges on. Get your game face on. And tell the devil he's alive. Jesus Christ, let's give him some praise now. No, I didn't win every fight, but bless God, I never walked away from one. Amen. I might not have won them, but they knew they'd been there. 
Amen. They knew they had been there. Some God put something in that little Irish kid that said, I didn't come here to lose. Amen. Bless God, we're going to get through this. And I want to say to somebody here today, we got to get our game face on. Amen. I want to tell you, the, we become the prey. Amen. And the Satan becomes the predator if he can sense any kind of weakness in our spirit. The Bible said it's a roaring lion. And what he does is he goes around the crowd, amen, of those that he's seeking to destroy, and he finds the weakest among them. Sometimes the small one. Sometimes the weakest one. Amen, the stragglers, those that just can't keep up with the herd. And he cuts them away from the herd. And the next thing you know, he's got them in the bushes somewhere, and he's tearing them apart. I heard somebody say the other day to ladies or to men, when you go to the mall, it's Christmas time. You know, they got folks out there that want to pray on the week, steal ladies' purses and everything like that. They're just a bunch of pansies anyway if they're picking on women. <laughs> they'll do it in the dark, but they won't do it in the light. But they'll hang out. You know what they tell you to do? When you come out of that mall door, ladies, and you start towards your car, you don't go towards your car going. No, they said, there's a sucker. There's one you can get. When you come out of that mall door, you come out of there like Stacy. Hey. They say, now that's a, that's a tiger there. You don't want to hang with that. You're going to come out with some scratches and some bites. <laughs> hey, but you're going to know you've got a whole wildcat. Amen. But if you come out of that mall, you know. Oh, honey, you're easy. You're easy, easy. You got to get your game face on. When you come out of church after Sunday morning, don't walk out of church. I don't know if I'll be back tonight. Pray for me. The devil sees that and he says, no, oh, I'm not going to mess with that. He said, hey, Junior, you go get him. I ain't going to waste a breath on that one. You go ahead and get him. He's got, he's got any resistance. Amen. We need to get the game face on. Let the devil know we're in this to win. We're not going to quit. We're all right. overcoming. And devil, we're going to spit in your eye. I said, we're going to spit in your eye. Amen. We're going to kick you. We're going to bite you. We're going to scratch you. We're going to know we're your, we're your worst nightmare. Right. How many would like to give hell a headache tonight? Right. Amen. Satan said, what's going on? He said, that among the life. My God, they're all full of faith. They made up their minds to live for God. They're not turning back. They're believing God's going to heal their bodies. Amen. Save their lost souls. Amen. And they're believing in great revival. Amen. That's that among the life. They got all the hells turning. When the leaves, my friend. Amen. If there's anybody get a game face on this old boy can. He can get the game face on. Amen. His business has had some challenges this past year. He's got every reason to be home this morning. Crying in his suit. But you know what? He got his game face on. He said, God's going to work this out somehow. He said, Pastor Moore, I don't know what the future holds for anybody. Well, none of us know. But he said, I'm going to step out of faith. And I'm going to get in my own. I'm going to be a self-employed. And we're going to make this thing work by the grace of God. Amen. Can you imagine how Bridget would feel if he went in there and said, Honey, I'm just going to lay across this bed and just, you know, I can't make it any further. I know what Bridget would do. I think I did. I've seen a side of that little thing. Amen. There's some fire down in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, but he doesn't do that. No, he bowls up and says, You know what? We're going to get through this. Got my game face on. What does that mean? It means I expect to win. I expect to succeed. I expect to overcome. You're not going to receive something without expecting it. If you're talking about losing, you won't be disappointed. You're going to lose. If you're not aiming for something, don't worry. You're just going to hit nothing. 
But if you're a child of God that's got your mind made up, irregardless of what I'm going to go through, what I'm going to face, even when I walk into the house of God, I'm not walking in like a loser. I'm coming in like a winner. I may be having to survive the delay, but I can wait it out if that's what God wants to do. Brother Price over here. We rejoice with him. We had the tumor removed. Doctor said there was no cancer in the tumor. But they go back and they dig a little deeper and they find some fatty tissue. And in that fatty tissue, they find carcinoma. And they tell him that now he's going to be taking radiation and chemotherapy. Amen. And through the process of it all, it may be three months, even yet more, that this young man is going to go through. Amen. You know what you do when you don't have a game face? You curl up in your bed, you cover your head up with covers. Amen. And you just cry and cry. And that's not to say that we don't have a little of that sometimes. We've got a reason to cry. But honey, you don't stay in bed. You don't give up. You don't throw in the towel and say, well, I'm through. No, you get your game face on. Yes, sir. You come on to the house of God. You clap your hands. Hallelujah. You worship God. Amen. Because you say, devil, I'm not an easy prey. Devil, I'm not an easy prey. If you've got to make that your balls I set on me, you're making a mistake. I'm still committed. I'm still dedicated. I'm still consecrated to the faith that God started. And he's going to finish it. Oh, let's praise him. I got my game for I heard a preacher some time ago. They said he used to come to church in a particular church somewhere. Then said, and I want you to know, depression is a real thing. It really is. We all deal with it. But I want to say this. You can get your game face on, and even inside you feel like things are terrible. All right. I'm going to get there. I may be dying on the inside, but I'm going to get there. Amen. My brother came to me here a few years ago. We were trying to get from A to Z, point A to B, just paying the financial obligations of the church. And that was back in, back about 93, somewhere along there. Amen. And I, I, I would go through some situations where I lost this, lost that, lost something else. And so my brother said he came down. I don't remember me saying this. This is my brother Jerry. He's not here to defend himself. But he said, he said, I told my wife, he said, well, I'm going down to the church. I'm going to go down there and encourage my brother. And I was down there falling out frozen chickens <laughs> to sell barbecue lunches so we could make a church go. And uh, so I was down there having a little smoker. I borrowed from a man here in town. I was out there, I never forget one morning about 5.30, Herschel, all that chicken fat caught on fire. And I had 105 chickens inside that smoker. And I saw flames coming out of that smoker, out the sides and out the lid. My Lord, I ran out there and I grabbed that thing and opened it up, fire coming rolling out. Amen. Then I had to put out the fire. That was, that was the trip. I was grabbing chickens and taking them to the church. Overall, black chickens. I was in there in the kitchen with a rag wiping off raw, rubbery chickens. A, a lustrous pastor of the life. 5.30 in the morning, rubbing on raw chicken. And it cleaned up, got the fire put out, got it back on the grill. Amen, I was sitting there just about the chickens were getting wrapped up. My brother said he talked to his wife. He said, I'm going down there to encourage my brother. He said, I know that he's going through it. Church is really going through it, so I'm going down there to encourage him. He said, Mike, you don't remember this, but when I got down there, he said, I got out of the car, and I said, well, how's it going? He said, well, we're cooking some chickens. And he said, you said, I said, well, how are you feeling? And you told me, he said, I told him, well, I'm just standing here thinking about how we can add on to this building right here. <laughs> what? Yeah, I said, yeah, we could put a drive through right here, pave that parking lot, the ladies wouldn't get their feet dirty when they got out of the car. He said, I went home and told my wife, there's nothing wrong with him. <laughs> See, he's talking about building another building. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to tell you, I didn't start out to quit. I said, I didn't start out to quit. I got my game face on. I want to serve notice of the Lord. 
I started out to win, and I'm still proud of Owen. I didn't start out to quit. I didn't start out to backslide. I didn't start out to turn around and go back home. But when I started to hear him say, Well done, now be a faithful servant. Oh, can you praise him? Oh, can you back to being faithful? Satan is never wavered in his desire to destroy every faithful child of God. I was thinking of a particular story in 1 Kings chapter 18. If you go back in your Bibles and read the history, you'll find that the prophet Elijah was faced with a real tough test. Because all of Israel basically had backslid and had gone into the worship of Baal. And Jezebel had commissioned all these false prophets, about 450 of them. So the Bible says that the Lord spoke to Elijah and said, you need to bring them down to Mount Carmel. Bring them to Mount Carmel. He said, let's have a test in worship. <clears throat> and so they built an altar. You know the story if you've read it. <clears throat> and they built this altar. It was a stone altar, 12 stones. They poured 12 barrels of water on it. And the Bible said that Elijah told the prophets of Baal, you guys go first. So they got them to sacrifice. They put it on the altar. They said, now just a minute. Don't need y'all bring any matches. It's going to have to be fire that comes from the heaven <clears throat> that consumes this sacrifice. I don't want anybody to put a fire underneath it. So he poured water all over it. And the Bible says that those men got out there and acted like fanatics. They acted like Pentecostals without the Holy Ghost. They danced. They cut themselves. They turned backflips. They did everything in the world to try to get the attention of their God. I really love the sense of humor that the prophet had. The Bible said they were getting so crazy because they wouldn't get any response. And Elijah said, maybe your God's on vacation. Maybe he went fishing. He actually said that. He maybe he's on vacation. So you're just going to have to holler a whole lot louder. But they just turned the volume up. And they did it all day long until the evening sacrifice. The Bible said they were just more completely out. In fact, they had already tore the altar apart. There's a problem, amen, when your worship just tears down an altar. It's obviously not real worship. All right. And so the Bible said that he rebuilt the altar. Amen. Poured water on it. And then he backed off and made a simple prayer. The Bible said fire came straight out of heaven. Not only consumed the sacrifice, it consumed the altar. It lapped up everything. There was nothing there but just a spot of dry ground when the fire got through. God consumed everything. And the Bible said that that, amen, proved to everybody else his God was the God that answered my fire. The Bible said then he turned around to some of those men and said, go destroy all these false prophets. Man, I tell you, they didn't play back then. They took those 450 prophets down to the river, cut their heads off. That's pretty stiff stuff there. Killed all 450 of them. Amen. And then the Bible said, amen, he went up and was sitting on the mountaintop. Amen. He turned and he said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. For three and a half years, God had put that country through a drought because they were worshiping the wrong God. You know, the blessings of the Lord are upon us when our worship is directed in the right place. When our worship is directed in the right place. And the Bible tells me that when he got down to pray, he said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. He said, Ahab, go get you something to eat. He said, and he said, I'm going to pray right here. And he started praying, and he told his servant, I want you to go look towards the ocean and tell me what you see. And the Bible said he went out there and he came back. He said, I don't see nothing. Went out there again the second time. He said, I don't see nothing. Third time, nothing. Fourth time, nothing. Five times, nothing. Sixth time, nothing. And he said, all right, go back seventh time. And when he went back, it's in the text here. The Bible said when he came back, he said, I see a cloud like a man's hand that arises up out of the ocean. About this big. In other words, you can put your hand up into the heavens and you can't see the cloud. It's about the size of your head. And the Bible said the prophet got up and said, man, get everything together. Go tell the king to get in his chariot and get to Jezreel because there's about to be a downpour. You know, folks, when you've got that winning attitude, boy, when you've got your face set like a flint, when you've got your face, it's a game face. 
You're in this to win. You don't have to have a whole lot of proof that God's working. All right. He was just seeing the little end of the biggest thing that was ever going to happen. And he said, that's enough for me. The Bible said he sent the king to the palace. And while the king was riding his chair to the palace, the Bible said the heavens were turned dark. And all of a sudden the rain began to fall down. Amen. And Noah Ahab was whipping them horses and trying to get them across the river before it overflowed. Amen. And about that time, here come old Elijah. Amen. He had to be running somewhere around 45 to 50 miles an hour. Ahab's horse was running at the breakneck speed of all they could do, probably around 35 to 40. I don't know if they had Arabian quarter horses, but he probably had a fast one. He was the king. He was running that horse wide open. When all of a sudden, if they had a rear view mirror, he looked in it, and my God, here comes a man in sand. You don't think I could do that, did you? Lord, <laughs> I can get the priest and I'm going to go sit down. <laughs> My God, he looks at his <laughs> room here. Here comes this guy. <laughs> and I can just mention, that ain't who I think it is. Amen. And then he sees that left wave to come on. <laughs> Amen. You know, I would have loved, there's some things about I love. That's one place I love to be. Riding in that chair, and I'll say, <laughs> The Bible says, and Elijah went before Ahab into Jezreel. What that means in just plain old East Texas English is that Elijah passed Ahab in his chair, running faster than his horses. And he went through the gate of the city faster than the king did. Oh, I'd have loved to see that. And then I'd have loved to see him when he put the brakes on. <laughs> I can see the men up there maintaining the gates. They said, my God, open the gates. They said, here comes he goes, Well, what in the world's that in front of him? Woo, I've never seen anything run that fast. Amen. Here come old Elijah, you know, just running wide open at about 55 miles an hour. Wham. Slides through the gate like he's coming into home base. And a swirl of dust just surfaces around. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. You haven't seen the church at its best. You haven't seen the church at its best. If we've got our game face on, we're not going to need God to bring fire down out of heaven. We're not going to need God to step down here robed in flesh, look us in the face and say, I am he. Get off of your duff and start living for me. But if you can feel what I'm feeling, I said, if you can feel what I'm feeling, obviously the devil knows something good is about to happen because he's working overtime to kill the church. I've never heard as much cancer. I've never heard as much leukemia. I've never heard as much COVID in all my life. But I'm going to tell you, I just saw the little end of something bigger than we've ever seen in our world. And God's about to put a in my feet. God's about to put a game face on my face. And we're still going to win by the help and the grace of God. Let's stand and give him some prayer. Oh, clap your hands up. I don't want y'all to get to fighting or nothing. 
I don't need any more. My time consuming counseling. You may have to say it from a distance. <laughs> Get your gang face on. All right. Let's keep winning. And they'll say, yeah, but we lost yesterday. But that doesn't mean we have to lose today. Let's keep our gang face on. And you've been praying for those kids for five years. Yeah, and I'll pray six. I'm going to pray until something happens. I'm going to pray until I see it. I'm going to pray until I get a breakthrough. I got my game face on. I said I got my game face on. Let's sing it later. I believe it. I swear. I believe it. I swear. I believe it. I swear.
He said, my boys, they come running up there and said, Daddy, we're going to go get him. <laughs> they tore off down the trail they got. He said, I waited until they got right up on that bear. And he said, I said, my God, he's still alive. <laughs> he said, my two little old boys fell all over each other. They fell out in the brush. He said, they got it. Amen. They started screaming and running back to me. Well, I'm going to serve notice on the devil. You gave me your best punch. And I went down. But God hollered and said, look out. He's still alive. Yeah. 